Hello, thanks for taking the time to join us for today's webinar from Real Story Group. If you were with us last week, we took a broader look at the MarTech space and some trends to keep an eye on uh, in the coming year and beyond. What we're gonna do this week is sort of narrow our focus a little bit and take a look at digital asset management trends to watch uh, in the coming year. We've got uh, our managing director and lead analyst, Jared Jingers with us. He's gonna take us through the heart of today's presentation. My name is Scott Dill. I'm on the business development team here. And uh, just to get you started a little bit about Real Story Group, as I do see a number of uh, new names on the line with us today. So welcome and thank you. Um, there are really three key ways in which um, you can engage with us. And um, we'll talk about this uh, in, in some detail here. First, you can leverage our research in sort of a, uh, self-service or a one-off type manner where uh, you subscribe to say for example our, our dam technology research leverage some advisory time with jared and make a selection uh, in that area for a number uh, of our customers they actually leverage all of the research that we offer when they're making more holistic choices uh, around their martech stack and taking uh, a broader look uh, at their martech stack and, and making choices in uh, a number of different areas so in that case, um, you can leverage our stack advisory offering, which actually has access to all of our research and then a bucket of hours you can use uh, with our analysts for those critical MarTech stack decisions. And we've been fortunate over the last few years to have a number of our customers join our stack leadership council, which meets three to four times per year, including in a couple of weeks on personalization and then in a couple months, uh, we'll actually meet again in person in Chicago. So these are marketing uh, technology and operations decision makers that are getting an opportunity to learn from each other and network uh, on either one specific topic during our virtual sessions or uh, on a number of topics when we get together uh, in person. So if that's interesting to you and something you wanna learn more about, uh, please reach out to us either during or after uh, today's presentation. In terms of the coverage areas that Real Story Group offers, um, this is our famous or perhaps infamous um, subway map. You can see um, these are the different technology areas that uh, we cover within our research. And today what we're gonna do uh, is focus on the, the purple line, that digital asset management space. And Jared's gonna walk you through uh, some trends in that particular area. What's unique about Real Story Group versus some of the other analyst firms that um, you may be familiar with is the fact that we never work for or advise the vendors that we cover in any way, shape, or form. So um, if you're familiar with Real Story Group, you know that we take a really no BS approach uh, in telling you what the vendors do well, um, but perhaps more importantly, what they don't do so well and where they could fall short for you. Um, so, you know, we're known as really uh, toughest critics in this space, and that's a reputation that we're actually quite proud of. That means our analysts, like Jared, uh, are doing their job. So I'm going to turn things over to him and, and take you through uh, the rest of today's presentation. Jared? Hey, thanks, Scott, and uh, thanks, everyone, so much for being here today. As always, we, we know you're busy, and it's really great to see so many of you coming for a presentation on the dam trends. It's it's an area that I am very passionate about. I spend my life watching the dam marketplace for the last decade plus um, or multiple decades plus looking at the content technology space, but dam in particular over the last decade. Um, so I am excited to share what we've been seeing in 2022 slash 2023. Um, for those of you who have been following the trends over the years, you, you, you might already be aware of this, but certain things change pretty fast in the technology space, but other things don't. And so I think there's one theme as I went through this year's trend that, you know, versus even last year's trends is their evolutions of certain themes as opposed to radical new ones. You know, I don't think there's, there's, there's a couple uber radical you know, trends that were influencing this industry as a whole that we've seen over the last few years. And we continue to snow see that snowball. We continue to see things build and vendors respond and buyers really pushing vendors and vice versa. And, and so, um, so again, if, if you've been following along the last few years, I think you'll see quite an evolution here as we, as we uh, continue to push things forward. All right, 
So I know when we when we did our marketing around this presentation, we said five trends uh, this year. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a little bit of a bonus trend. So we're gonna have six trends that we're, that we're watching. I couldn't I couldn't narrow it down to just five. I had to tell you about my my top six. So trend number one: market splits are actually what I, from my perspective, looking more like market chasms these days. What does that mean? Well, again, those of you who have been following us in Real Story Group for a, a, a long time, particularly the dam space, you know that I in particular like to talk about the four phases of a person's digital asset management journey. You know, a dam 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 phases. And we use this, this spectrum, if you will, to kind of gauge where someone is in their maturity uh, with, with digital asset management. So let me just introduce you to these phases. DAM 1.0 is what we call our standalone library type phase, where you're managing assets through a life cycle, but that repository is probably disconnected from your larger stack of technologies. You know, So it's a truly another destination to, uh, to store and retrieve assets. In a 2.0 world, we're talking more as dam, of DAM as a MarTech service or a service to the enterprise as a whole, right? So it's more connected to the enterprise. So it's a critical part of a workflow. There's maybe upstream integrations and perhaps downstream integrations. Um, you're likely using your DAM to supply some systems of engagement like web content management tools or email marketing tools or marketing automation tools, social publishing tools and the like. But pretty uh, typical of a, of a 2.0 organization is that it's a one-way flow of information from those upstream systems into a dam out into the world. A few years back, we really saw this Uber trend start to hit this space. And that's this notion of thinking bigger than just traditional assets, uh, asset management even, and thinking you know, how can we power more omni-channel consistent experiences across every single touch point by using a single source of truth for our assets, our media, uh, our narrative uh, uh, objects, our data objects, and managing them in a way that was much more tightly bound as opposed to complete disparate separate systems. Um, really thinking much more about the notion of not, not just single assets, but componentized assets or, or compound assets made, made out of a bunch of components, if you will. And, really pushing our, our, our own industries and our own practices to think about not only this one way flow of information, but how can we round trip some information back to a, a platform of sorts to then influence future decisions. So that's a big characteristic of a 3.0 world. And then we've been talking a lot about 4.0 and what's next, you know, what, is, what does it look like as we begin to leverage AI more, leverage data more and, think of our platforms less as a as a responsive tool to uh, what we tell it to do but maybe have it do a little bit more work for us and bubble up information you know maybe we can use our platforms as a, as a tool that we query to get answers to to real contexts in in uh, or, or real questions around real contexts uh, in different environments and that kind of thing and i'll talk a little bit more about that as we go as we go through here but this is the spectrum that um the that that I see people typically go on a journey. You know, typically someone starts in a 1.0 world and, and and is really pushing towards uh, this 4.0 destination. However, as an analyst, and when, when I look at the marketplace, I what I've really noticed over the last few years in particular, and really over the last year, is that certain vendors in the digital asset management space are targeting certain phases of this journey. There are some vendors who were fundamentally built to solve a 1.0 scenario. And still to this day, they're having trouble meeting some of the MarkTech integrated uh, service type type use cases that, that many buyers are looking to get. That's increasingly rare in, in this case, but there are still some, but but most vendors are have kind of transitioned to a point where they're at, where they they see themselves as, as players in the 2.0 space um, so you're gonna have a lot if, if you're looking for a 2.0 vendor there's a lot of options out there for you not all of them but some, but most of them are but where I see a, a chasm really emerging is getting into this 3.0 world you know the there's a lot of vendors who have 
firmly made the investment to, to, to try to cross this chasm and become an omni-channel content platform for you and are really thinking about not only 3.0, but 4.0 as well. Uh, but some others, due to a couple reasons, you know, most, most notably they are, that the architecture under the hood is a little bit creaky and a little bit old and, and it doesn't allow themselves to manage some of the sophisticated compound mixed media um, relationships and that, that are needed to really do 3.0 right. Uh, they're having trouble crossing that chasm, and so they're firmly stuck here. And this has impact on buyers too, as you might imagine, as as, you, as buyers try to progress down this journey and where they might have been when they bought that technology five, ten years ago. There, they might be feeling some real growing pains as they try to uh, try to move along the spectrum. When we look at the marketplace, you know, we, we try to slice and dice it in a variety of different ways. One of the ways that, one of the most simple and obvious ways is to put them on a complexity spectrum, you know, from a complex type vendors to simple vendors to, to more mid-range vendors. And, you know, when, we, when I think about marrying that up with the, the phases of that damn journey, it's not as easy as just saying all the complex vendors can get you to 4.0 because that's not the case. Some are very much investing in that and, and you'll have a better chance of getting there with some of the vendors in the complex space, uh, but not all of them. Likewise, some of the vendors in the mid and even simpler uh, spaces are thinking much more omni-channel, you know, not pitching holding themselves into just traditional asset management. And, uh, and so that might be a better right size fit for you in, in your use case, but, but again, it's not not all of them in, in those categories are are making the leap to or, or can get you to a, a 3.0 world. So the the onus is more incumbent on on you all as buyers to not only just look at at single snapshot views of the marketplace like this, but really do your digging and and see and test these vendors as to how well they can get to your specific use cases as it relates to your damn journey. Not only where you are today, but where you want to go in the short, medium, and long term. So with that as sort of some background, let's get into, into some, some details. And as I mentioned, some of these things will build on some of the themes we've already talked about. Trend number two is something we're calling the inconvenient truths around DAM and omni-channel content platforms, that 3.0 world, if you will. Why are we even talking about this? So um, many followers of, of Real Story Group, we like to use reference models to start conversations. This is one that's very popular. It's like, we call it our composable stack reference model. This is sort of a traditional view of, of, of many enterprises stack over the last decade, where if I, if I look at the top layer of this layer cake, you know, you have a, a number of engagement channels. Moving down, you have a number of interaction and delivery environments. And then finally, you have these engagement services tools where these are where people are within your teams are building experiences, whether it's web experiences or email experiences or social experience, or maybe it's your sales team building experiences when they get calls, you know, either inbound calls or outbound calls, um, or maybe it's even how you aggregate information together to get the third parties. This is where a lot of work gets done in building experiences. But if we're trying to move to more of an omni-channel world where consistent ex experiences are received at every single touch point, we got to get out of a situation where our content and data and decisions are put into tools that were solely designed to publish to a single channel or, or multiple channels. We need to think much more omni-channel. So what happens over the last few years, we've seen this trend to really move your foundational services, your foundational content and your information, your foundational data and your foundational decisions lower in your stack so that you're able to provide these basic building blocks as a service to your enterprise, as a service to those working within engagement services tools so that they're able to create, pull from that common repository to create consistent experiences at every single touch point. So what does that mean for us as in, in the damn world? Well, I'm going to focus your attention down to the lower left and think about digital asset management, but also think about omni-channel content services. And if you're in the product world, I want you to think about maybe things related to your core products. If you're working in the museum world, think about your collections management system and, and things related to your core objects. Um, but core data uh, or information as it relates to what you're selling is for many of you is so important. So I want you to think of that in that content and 
information uh, sector as well. So the vision that many buyers that I speak to today are, are really trying to achieve is say, how can we think more holistically here? I, I don't wanna create more silos in my organization. I don't wanna create a silo just for my pro product information, my, my digital assets. And now if I wanna think about more omni-channel text and narrative type contact, uh, content, I don't wanna create another silo there and try to marry these things up. Is there a, truly a way that I can start to think of these things in a closer re relationship. Can I think about these in a more, in a platform that provides omni-channel content in a reusable and a trackable way to then deliver it out to my engagement services, which will in, in turn get out to the, my interaction environments. So we need to start think bigger, right? We need to think bigger than, uh, as damn people, we need to start thinking bigger than just traditional images, video, and audio. Let's think bigger. Let's think about copy. Let's think about text. Let's think about product descriptions. Let's think about offers and micro experiences and even documents. And how can we make that, those things, those, those on, that omni-channel content, how can we make it more impactful by fueling it with data, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that relationship between content and data as we go forward. But that's a key differentiator here as we begin to think about what are we, what are we doing as we're managing omni-channel content across our enterprise. So again, if we're trying to get to a 3.0 world, what are the inconvenient truths that we're experiencing? Well, first of all, there's a lot of vendors out there realizing that a lot of you want to move up this journey. Right? There's a lot of vendors out there who say, I want to be your, your omni-channel content platform vendor. There's a lot of damn vendors. There's a lot of web content management vendors, clear, uh, most notably some of the, the, the headless vendors out, out there. There's a lot of product information management vendors who want to be your OCP. There's a lot of asset distribution vendors who want to be your, your OCP. There's even CRM tools and marketing automation, uh, marketing operations tools that want to be your OCP. So that on one, on one side, it's very clear trend that we're seeing. There's tons of vendors out there who are all making strategic investments to, to manage your traditional media tools, your text tools, your information and data side by side to power omni-channel experiences. That's clear, that's absolutely happening. But on the flip side, there's a lot of vendors, so even some really big name vendors and some consultants out there who are telling bu buyers that this is impossible and that you shouldn't go with this approach. Now, from a vendor standpoint, I can almost see it. It's some vendors who, like I said earlier, whose systems were fundamentally not built to, to make this journey with you. They were fundamentally built in a way that is kind of old fashioned and hierarchical and to, to, to adapt to a new world where you're expanding your, your purview, not only into new, new content types, but new relationship types, it's hard for them to make that, that, that jump. And in some cases impossible without rebuilding the underlying architecture. To that end, there's some vendors that really did re redo their underlying architecture so that they could help you get on this journey. So it's, it's, a, it's a very real phenomenon. Likewise, there's a bunch of consultants out there that I've seen speaking at conferences and, and, and whatnot and giving webinars and, and from hearing this through the grapevine from clients that we're working with that are saying that you shouldn't do this. Well, it doesn't surprise me either. If, if, you're, if, if you spend your whole life telling people just about DAM and, or just about PIM or just about web content management, maybe that's all you see and, and you don't understand maybe some of the other, the other marketplaces and, how, and the impacts that, 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 that those will have. Um, it's, it's been a hard tradition, transition for all of us to think bigger and, and to, to kind of blur the lines between some, some marketplaces that are fairly mature, but this is a phenomenon that's absolutely happening. And the good news as, you know, as I sit here on a, on a damn webinar and talking to most likely damn people, you know, I think w what we see is that I don't know who's gonna win this race to be your OCP, but today, I, as I believed a year ago today, I, I, I still think this is true, that damn vendors are better positioned to be your omni-channel content platforms because they are, tend to be more scalable and robust repositories. They already cracked the nut of the images and media and video for that matter. Um, and their object-oriented architectures of some of those players, again, not all, but some of them, you know, to be able to manage some complex parent, child and sibling and other kind of relationships, I think that is gonna go a long way for, 
for dam vendors to ultimately uh, win out, at least in the short term here. Another inconvenient truth as it relates to omni-channel content is, while this is probably the topic that we speak about most to our clients, literally every day we're speaking with some of our, our, our clients about how to get to this to that 3.0 world, in the reality of the situation is very few have cracked the nut completely. Um, you know, we, as Scott mentioned, we, we have this group of, of, uh, of clients on our omni-channel uh, stack leadership council that was built to talk about these types of things as it relates to content and data and decisions when pushed to kind of do a self-assessment as to what's their maturity level uh, as it relates to things like analytics and operations and data and orchestration they actually rated their progress least on true omni-channel content so this is a massive push from a vendor perspective, I know it's a massive of, of interest of the buyer's perspective, but in reality, we're not there yet and very few are doing this really, really well. All right, trend number three, the need for speed. When we talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning and uh, things like uh, chat GPT and, and all these other things that are, are more, have become mainstream stream in our world. You know, when it comes to applying AI to, to dam, I can't tell you how many demos that I've seen. I'm sure many of you have seen this. The, the best use case that, that could be applied was auto-suggesting metadata. And I don't want to poo-poo that. I think it's awesome. I think it's great. However, let's be honest, it beca it's become kind of commoditized at this point. There's a lot of different services that provide that. Almost all the dams have, have implemented this in some way, some better than others, but it's, it's become com kind of commonplace at this point. What I think is more interesting in a trend to watch in today and in going forward is we're seeing AI triggering logic within platforms. So I think based on assets that are uploaded within system, I think you get presented with custom entry fields. Uh, based on what it what it what it might know about uh, a particular type of content, you, you might know I need certain metadata. I might suggest it where I can, but I might build over over time a, a profile, a, sort of like a progressive profile that you see on public web forms. You might get that within your your platforms now, and building building things as we as we go along based on what it what the system knows. You know, custom workflows based on what information you put into the system different rights requirements based on what you put into the system more more proactive duplication checks more proactive infringement checks i think you know looking out on the web to see if a, an asset is that's been putting in here do you have the rights to use it is it is it already out there in in uh, on the on the web or on other 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 properties and and, and do you are you are you at risk of violating an agreement flag me before that becomes an issue rather than later and then i th i think this can be taken even a step further where we start to think about this future world where ai can even suggest copy or uh, even even vice versa copy could could in turn suggest you know assets that, that should be created and, and, and doing things on the fly based on what you put into the system generating new content out of that you know, I think I think AI and 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 logic are, are coming closer together within these platforms and becoming a much more interesting story uh, in in the in the not too long term future. Trend number four is this false choice between content and data. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I think a few years back, you know, maybe a decade ago, you you had the you had, the, you had the content people within the enterprise and the data people within the enterprise, right? The content systems and the data systems. Um, I think more recently we've seen those lines start to blur. You know, the data is becoming closer to content, but more sophisticated enterprises look something like this. The content and data systems and people are getting closer and closer. And I expect those those ovals or circles to to become even more even more uh, aligned as, as we go forward. This is this is without a doubt happening uh, with many of our clients. 
The next trend is is something that I'm going to piggyback on uh, on a, a last year's trend. Last year we talked about this predictive dam, you know, leveraging analytics to suggest better performing assets, uh, being able to query uh, uh, the system to answer content text questions. And I think if I see a trend, this is this this concept has really resonated among buyers, but many of them are not ready yet, so they're preparing to be ready for this they're preparing for this predictive future um you know i i've introduced this concept before but what if you're able to query this platform of the future to say hey i'm running a campaign i'm trying to reach this particular cohort which asset based on analytics that i have in the system which assets is more is more likely to perform better you know again this is a very simple example but that notion of being able to query a system i think is is really important and then thinking about predicting asset performance at scale we have, we're all so bogged down with assets in, in our system and content and the like. And what if we're able to have a system bubble up content to us and say, hey, have you thought about using this, this piece of content? As opposed to us always looking, thinking of a repository as something we go search and find something that we know exists. What if our systems were more proactive and, and predictive as to what is, is important to us? So, as I said, that's a great theory and people within every single in industry that we work with are thinking about this and thinking about the impact, but they're asking, they're starting to ask hard questions around how do we prepare ourselves for this? Is our content granular enough to support this or is it overly granular? And then from the data side, do we have clean, complete data? Is our data really telling us the truth? Are we confident in our data? Do we need to provide more context to our data to be able to act on some of these things? And then even maybe more critical is if we were able to put these things closer together in a, in a single system, what does that user experience look like? Um, do we have the right org structure in place to support this? And do we have the right people in place to, with the right skill sets to be able to do this? And all that is definitely involved, uh, evolving. And of course, if we talk about people and process and resources and, 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 and uh, alignment, you know, and, and organizational structures, we have to talk about the technology. And we've seen a real impact on the process to select technology as it relates to, do I have the right technology to get me on my journey? For many organizations that we speak to, their current technology is holding them back. It's preventing them from crossing that chasm to the next phase. For others, it's more in, in institutional, and for many, it's both. And so with sort of this increased ambiguity between systems, you know, it's not as simple as, hey, let, let's go buy a dam, let's go buy a, uh, a product information management system, let's go buy a collections management system. The, the, the boundaries between these things are beginning to blur, so it's creating more pressure on selections teams, particularly to educate their leadership, to say it's not as easy for looking at just a single marketplace we have to spend more time doing our our due diligence and putting our the vendors through the through the pages to ensure that they're the right fit for our needs both today and in the future we're seeing more rfis as opposed to going right to rfp because of this right so rfis to vendors that might span traditional categories we're doing some now that we have dam vendors at the table pim vendors at the table content aggregators at the table all showing their capabilities and where so that the buyers can clearly see where one system might end and one might begin. We're seeing more intense proofs of concepts uh, because this concept is new and some of the integrations are different than traditional, uh, traditionally in the past. So more intense proofs of concepts to, to prove those, those integrations out. And then the need for third party assistance, both from a technical standpoint but also for those softer skills, you know, to make sure that your content and data are clean, to make sure that it, your processes are ready to support this, this new notion of omni-channel content as a service to your enterprise across team. It's, it's really putting a, a, a critical emphasis on, on getting the, the right skill sets in-house to, to help you with that as well. All right, that was a really quick overview. I, I, I hope I, I didn't go too, too fast, but I'm happy to have conversations more down the road. Um, if anyone disagrees, feel free to, to send that as well. I always like to, to hear disagreements, but uh, I can tell you much of this is, 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 or all of this is taken from our experience working with the vendors and seeing how they've been pivoting to, to, to address some of these trends and the buyers who are telling us, this is what we want from our vendors. So it, it's a, 
it's a real interesting time, um, and I, I, I expect these things to continue to evolve as we as we go forward. If anyone wants to talk more, feel free to reach out. Like I said, uh, happy to, happy to discuss. And if anyone is interested in seeing what we've written about the various vendors uh, that are out there, we have research that is very specific to this omni-channel content challenge, you know, for those vendors where we clearly show how vendors or haven't, or, or either how they have or haven't crossed that chasm to addressing that 3.0 world. Um, or, and we have uh, evaluations that really show how the vendors tackle the 1.0 world, the 2.0 worlds as, as well. So uh, feel free to download a sample of that to, check out, uh, get a sense of, of, of our, our analysis there. Anyways, thank you all so much again for taking some time today. We really appreciate it as always. We'll talk to you again down the road. Thanks.